So, welcome to lecture 5.4. Uh, tonight's lecture is <coughs> on quite an interesting topic. It's called designing for, su designing for maintainability, not sustainability. And it's essentially a lecture where we really try and uncover a really important concept, which is maintainable software. And what maintainable software is. And the reason that we care about maintainable software is because maintainable software is resistant to breaking when inevitable changes occur over time. So every piece of software will, over time, for many different reasons, change in some way or be forced to change by other factors. And something that we want you to keep at the core of your brain whilst you're writing code is how to think about software in, in essentially in this maintainable lens. You know, how do you make sure that your software will stand the test of time? We will be talking about... Uh, why we care about maintainability. We'll be talking about how we maintain software and then some examples of increasing the maintainability of software as well. So that, that should be good. It will be very high level. This is kind of meant to be a quick introductory thing with a few code examples. It's uh, The emphasis is not for you to walk away with essentially kind of a rote learned idea of what maintainability is, but more of a, for lack of a better word, a spiritual understanding of what it might be. So let's see how we go. Okay, so um, first to recap, what is software engineering? We talked about this back in week one. Software engineering is the idea of focusing on building the right software for the right people and making sure that it's maintainable over time as the software grows and as the people who work on it change. We talked about this in week one because it kind of is the underpinning of the course. The idea that the difference between being a programmer and a software engineer is the fact that we don't just care that you can write code. You need to write code that will stand stably and happily over time, right? I can tell you right now there are millions, probably tens of millions of people, I have no idea how many, that can write code. And I can tell you that most of them don't do a very good job at it in the context of thinking over the, like, through the long term. This is where you're going to stand out. One thing I, I, I talked about a lot um, in previous iterations of this course was the idea that you need to kind of start to get through your head the idea that you... Being able to write code, you being able to program means nothing to anyone of any value, right? There are so many people out there who can write code and, and they can do it for 2 or $3 an hour. And if you, if you intend to have a career in the area of software engineering, you need to kind of get your head into gear if you aren't already, and I'm sure many of you are, that seeing a problem and writing code to solve that problem and that problem being solved just doesn't mean diddly squat because so many people can do it. You need to be thinking that you can problem solve better and relevant to tonight that you can come up with solutions that don't only work but work over time. So this this green bit I've highlighted about maintaining it over time really is the key bit and that's why we're talking about maintainable software today. So why do we care about this? I mean this is somewhat obvious, but it's still worth mentioning. Um, <coughs> we've said that software changes over time out in the real world. We've said that the less easily maintainable software, and we haven't said this, but the less easily maintainable software is, the harder it is to adapt to these changes. That makes sense, right? If you create something that's like really rigid, like, you know, you, you power drill your bed into the, into the floor and into the wall, or you install cupboards into the walls, the less um, versatile and flexible it is, the harder it is for you to adapt anything and to change anything over time. And that means that you have to put more time in later on. It's a pretty straightforward conceptual idea, right? Um, <coughs> and maintainable software, what it tends to do, this is a really important thing to remember as a phrase, it resists the tendency to break as software changes or grows. Because as anything in life, and this is true just not in software, many, many other things, as they change and grow over time, they will have a tendency to break. And your objective is to resist that change. And this is more critical probably now than ever because software essentially gets written at a, an extremely rapid pace nowadays. Uh, we talk about this a little bit more in week eight when we, when we touch on deployment, but <clears throat> software nowadays is written on a daily, weekly, monthly basis as opposed to in the past where they used to maybe program a video game for two years and then send it out. So there's a lot more pressure nowadays for you to write software and finish software in a much more condensed amount of time. You don't really have a lot of time to kind of go and perfect it. So the only real way to write good software is as you go, 
to a large extent. You can't kind of come back and say, well, we'll fix it up later this year. It just doesn't really happen in many, many real world scenarios. So um, why does software change over time? I keep saying that software has this tendency to change over time or as people work on it, point one. When you have new people come into any team or old people leave teams, they will bring with it, they will bring with them their own experiences their own understanding and their own lack of understanding, right? When you work on a project, imagine you're working on your major project right now. You have experience with it. You have your own ex experience with programming. <laughs> you understand the assignment broadly. When someone else comes in in week seven, not that they are, don't worry, they're going to bring their own things and they might make mistakes, right? We're all essentially big mistake engines as people. We're just kind of putting out mistakes all the time and it's just a question of whether you put out a little or a lot. So as you do bring people in, you will kind of have that that tendency and that problem. Requirements change over time. This is either someone saying we don't want things to happen anymore or someone saying that we want new things added all the time. I mean, this happens everywhere, right? What, tell me a, a website or an app that you've used that isn't changing in some way or hasn't changed over a 12 month period. And it changes because businesses grow, they get more money, they get less money. Um, they have different demands from their consumers, whether they're businesses or end consumers, and it's just inevitable. There's very few pieces of software you would use that are just kind of the same forever, right? Um, <coughs> there's a need to increase performance. This happens, right? You'll write a piece of software and maybe it'll work for a couple of people, but then a hundred people or a thousand people start to use it and suddenly it starts to be too slow. Or to tie into the fourth point, it starts breaking. And if it's too slow or it's breaking, what do you what do you need to do? You need to change the code in some way. You need to change your software. And if it's hard to change, you're going to spend more time on it. And if it's hard to change, you may end up <laughs> introducing bugs. So code pretty much always grows. Never shrinks might be a bit of a dramatic comment, but in a large sense, it's very rare that you have the ability to actually like, it's very easy to make, add more code. Right? Oh, there's a bug, I'll add code to fix it. Oh, code's slow, I'll add some other code to speed it up. We need a new feature, I'll add some more code. A new person comes on, they write code that they didn't realize they didn't have to write because they're not familiar with things. So code will just expand. And whilst you might think, no, no, I'm really good at cleaning up my code. I'm really, if you've done some personal projects or something like that. The problem is, is that a lot of, a lot of the model you might have when it comes to maintaining code is in a in a little bubble of your hobby on the weekend or something. But if you're in a workplace or you're in some kind of organization that's paying you, often they will not be too concerned with you saying, oh, I'm just going to spend the next month kind of cleaning up my code and shrinking it down because they're going to be like, we're paying you money. We need you to do things that actually matter to people who maybe don't understand programming or who do, doesn't really matter. So again, to my point before, it's not really a case of you having a capacity to kind of come in and clean things up and shrink your code down, you need to get into a better headspace of having things written, ready to adapt as they go. There's a very <coughs> strong argument to say that software maintainability is more important than software performance. The reason for this is because if code isn't maintainable, then performance issues will essentially appear throughout those changes over time. So it might be easy to be like, ah, yes, I'm going to do this thing with my code that makes the code kind of crappy and hard to use, but it's really fast. You know, if you've done comp 2521 or something, but again, that's because you're working on it today, right now, who says you'll be working on it in six months, who says that what it's doing today will be what it does in six months. All of these things can change. And if they change, you will find that it may get slower, for instance. So maintainability is super key to performance, ironically. Um, and if it is maintainable, if, if it is all these things we're going to talk about when it comes to what maintainable software is, it'll actually be really easy to speed up because it'll tend to be modular and well-written and people will know what to do with it. And, and you've all kind of seen this, right? Um, sometimes we talk about things like spaghetti code. You might've heard that term thrown around. Uh, if you ever had a pile of stuff on your desk, that's all stacked up, you're scared to touch anything, right? Because you know if you pull one thing out like a Jenga tower, it's all going to come crumbling down. So how do you organize your code like a nice spread out series of things that you know you can touch and move and not destroy everything else? That's, that's all the philosophy. I think one thing that I haven't touched on there, maybe it comes up later. I don't think so. 
um, is just around the why. There's one element of the why that hasn't been mentioned, and, and it's actually just a lot to do with money, frankly, you know? It's, it's all well and good for us to sit around and talk about the importance of maintainable software that make, you know, your life easier as a programmer, which is an important thing. You know, you want to be happy. You want to work on software that feels good. But at the end of the day, whether you're working for a for-profit business or not-for-profit business, a university, something like this, at the end of the day, everyone is spending money and they are trying to get an outcome. That is 99% of what you do with software. And poorly maintained software is an inhibitor to that journey. If your software is hard to maintain, it means that each dollar you spend trying to develop a new feature or to change it will come with a 20, 30, 40 cent, maybe $2 cost of fixing bugs and making other improvements. You know, sometimes again, we refer to this stuff as tech debt. There's lots of names you might hear thrown around in various capacities or not. Uh, but it really is just essentially delayed pain. And we all know this. You, who's I, I don't drink alcohol, but I'm sure there's some of you in here that drink alcohol and... You've probably done that too, where you think, I'm going to go out on a Friday night and drink a lot and I will let tomorrow me worry about the problem, right? It's all the same thing. These are, these are not new ideas. These are lessons of life that you have learned and said, hmm, maybe I'll spend a little bit more time right now thinking about future me so that future me is not miserable. Same stuff. So let's get into the how. <coughs> Generally, there are a few ways that you can improve software maintainability. Uh, there are three that we think are worth talking about in the course. The first one is testing. Uh, we've talked about testing. We talked about testing back in week two. We kind of talked about it with static verification in week three. And we talked about it in the sense of if you can make sure that your software is safe and it's correct, it becomes easier to change without worrying that the software will regress. Okay, because if you have a good test suite, and you might already be noticing this, for instance, with iteration one, you might have found this potentially while you're working, uh, it, you know, you, you have confidence that you can change it and not break things. Because you got big complex software, no one's ever going to understand it, no one's ever going to be able to eyeball if it works, but your tests will look after you. So that's kind of one aspect of maintainability that we've talked about. The other two aspects aren't really to do with testing and they're more to do with design. But what we're going to do for a second is we're going to we're going to distinguish the idea of system design to code design. So system design is planning systems to make sense at a very high level. Um, I think I have some examples of this in this lecture, which we'll get to in a bit more detail down. Yeah. Oh, I think actually, sorry, we get into that in um, week seven. So that's two weeks from now because we've got the, the break coming up. Um, that's that's really sitting down and saying, you know, it's it's kind of pen and paper stuff. Flow charts, diagrams, it's thinking about software and structures and schematics and systems. And what that helps you do is if you if you design software correctly, what you can help make sure is that your software doesn't do too little or is not prepared for too little, but also not prepared for too much. And we'll talk about that a bit with code design, but some of these principles carry through. So it's really before you write any code, are you building something that's smart? And again, many of you have come across situations like this before. If you ever bought a laptop or a phone and you've asked yourself the question, you know, should I spend a thousand dollars on a phone? Hmm. If you spend too much on a phone, then you've just bought a really expensive phone and it's going to last you four or five years. No one really lasts that long these days, but you know, you bought a really expensive phone that lasts a couple of years. Okay, you kind of over-engineered your solution. You bought this really top-end phone that kind of does a bunch of stuff you don't need it to. Great, congrats, you wasted a few hundred dollars, but if you buy a really cheap phone, you might, it might end up breaking soon, it might end up not having 5G on it or some other feature you need, and you could end up spending more money always buying crappy phones that break a lot, right? So there's, there's, there's a certain level of good judgment that comes to picking what the right approach through is. And when it comes to designing software systems and thinking about what should the software do? If you think back to your project, should the software, um, should not that you decide this for the project, but imagine if you did, you know, should your Teams app that you're building, should it, should it let you send direct messages? Should it let you send messages? Should it let you pin posts? Should it let you save posts? Are these things you should think about? Are these things you should prepare? Do you need to think about how voice messaging or calls works as part of your system design? 
And getting this right can make your software much more maintainable because it means that when programmers go and implement stuff, they're doing so in a very flexible system. But again, that might be very heady or conceptual for you, and we will talk about that more when we do conceptual modeling in week seven. But the third and most important point today is code design. Code design is thinking about code at both a high level, maybe pseudo code and a low level in terms of how it's written. Um, and making sure that your code is resilient to adapt to inevitable changes in the future because someone's going to come along and change your code. Maybe it's you, maybe it's someone else, maybe the person that's changing it doesn't even like work there anymore. Who knows? We need to be ready for that. So for this code design, um, <coughs> typically code design is something that you will do between when you write your tests and when you write your code. So if you're familiar again from the first iteration, you will go and write some tests in Jest, then you will come along and say, all right, time to implement something. But code design is that thing you do in your head just before you write code and you think, what am I actually gonna put down on the page here? Again, sometimes we have referred to it as pseudocode. If you have done comp 2521 or you're doing it concurrently, you might've been exposed to that in slightly more detail. And it really is when you understand what solution you need, but you don't know how to do it and you wanna flesh out your code. Um, our tendency as humans is to not write well-designed code. We're not particularly good at it. We're often in a rush. People are putting pressure on us. We're tired. We're sleepy. I don't imagine many of you are watching this lecture right now saying, yeah, I'm well exercised, well eaten and well slept. And I have plenty of time to think deeply about my problems with my code. That's probably none of you. And therefore you will have a tendency not to write well-designed code on average. Um, so good code design takes a little bit more time and energy in the short term and you have to kind of force yourself to sit down and think about it, but it, again, it does pay off in the future. So there have been a lot of instantiations of this lecture in some way or another and my preferred way in a way that I'm trialing out this term is to instead of, I know there's seven here, that's quite funny, six design questions to ask. Um, Rather than tell you, you know, here's a design principle, you know, the, the ABC design principle, I actually kind of want you thinking a bit more about questions that are healthy to ask. And I like questions for a bunch of reasons. Questions tell you that you've got a problem to think about and not, a, an, not an answer to, to hammer in somewhere. They're also really good because it helps you actually work with other people. It helps you look at other people's code. It helps you ask questions to people you work with. Um, so let's go through these seven questions. I don't know why it says six, I'm sorry. But question one, is there one source of truth for this? This is probably one of the easiest ones and something you would have figured out in your very first um, programming course in 1511. And <coughs> it's essentially the idea of trying not to repeat yourself. Sometimes we follow this principle and we call it the don't repeat yourself or the dry method. And it essentially tries to discourage the amount of times in your code that you repeat the exact same information. And it tries to encourage you reducing things down to one source of information. Because when you repeat yourself, again, fairly straightforward concept, a change to any one of those repeated values or capability requires changing it in all the locations. And you've, you've seen this in your pro programming, right? If you've got, if you've got a piece of code, um, <coughs> what do we got? You, you, you've seen things like this where you might go and have, let's look at a piece of C code because it's an easy example. You got say an array of 10 items, then you have a for loop, int i equals zero, i is less than 10, i plus plus, and you do something with that array, right? You go and initialize that array. There you go, cute little piece of code all inside a main function. Because you've got this 10 defined in two places, you are repeating yourself. So when you ask that question, does everything where possible have a single source of truth? No, it doesn't because the size of my array is defined in two places. So I'm gonna go and make it a single source of truth up here. And by making it a single source of truth, I am now reducing the surface area of something going wrong because if the array size changes, it's just changing in one place. Therefore, my code has a tendency to resist breaking when someone changes it. It's all part of that same principle. Um, so, you know, quote, every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, author authorita authoritative, authoritative representation within a system. Pretty straightforward concept. Again, I think that one's been hammered into you implicitly. Even if you don't teach young programmers that, they figure it out pretty quickly because it feels, um, it feels nice 
You know, it's like, it's like consolidating. Everyone loves that. Everyone loves going through their drawer and organizing all the pens in one spot and the pencils in another spot. I don't know if anyone still has pens and pencils, but it's just relaxing and humans tend to like it. So that one's pretty intuitive, but that's the question you can ask. Is there one source of truth for this? It's a question I ask all the time. It's a question people I work with ask all the time. Uh, we see something new. We see maybe a port number or a URL or something. And we say, ha, huh, okay. Um, sometimes it's not even about seeing two instances of it and asking people if they can combine it. But other times it's actually about even asking a deeper question, which is, is this defined somewhere else? in another file somewhere? Do you even need to define it at all in this file? Like, even though you've defined it only once in this file, even though this has a single source of truth in this file, across all the other files in our project, have you undermined that, you know, that rule? Have you failed to answer that question adequately? So, let's look at <coughs> an example. A uh, really simple example. We won't run it or anything. We've got a small little TypeScript file here. Uh, it's called uh, dry dirty, which means, you know, it's a don't repeat yourself dirty question. It's, it's a pretty straightforward program. It imports the process library from Node, which lets us get access to argv, which is, you know, the command line argument. Um, you know, we check if the, the length of the command line arguments is not equal to three. If it's not three, we crash and kill the program. If it is equal to three, we parse in the input from the command line. And if the number is two, we loop through it between 10 and 20, we loop from i from 10 to 20, we print out all the powers like this, and if it's three, we loop through it and we print out all the powers. So for those here, how many we got currently? We got 40 people in the lecture, so, you know, shoot me some ideas. If I asked you that question, right, I come to you and I say, is there one source of truth for this? Where in this code, like, have you made sure, Hayden, that everywhere in this code, there's one source of truth for all the information you can? Where have I failed to answer that question adequately, right? That's, that's really the question. So shoot me some examples that you have of where you feel I have let you down there. Uh, you can pause the video on this. I'm just going to, I'm just going to actually run the terminal for a second. So I'll give you like 30 seconds to answer that question. I'm just going to navigate into the folder. Um, and we can run it because running it's fun. So I run it like this and this program will just running it by itself. It will not do anything. It will actually exit one because argv I'm pretty sure by default is two because argv will take in the command that I use to run the program, which I think is this. And then it will take in the file path. I can actually show you this here just by, um, if I console log argv, you'll see what the JavaScript away, array decides to print out. Oops. Yeah, so you see there's the actual binary that we ran. It's the TS node like program that we ran, you know, we have here. Um, and then we have the file that we ran it with. Okay, so Alex has said, um, let me just pull up let me just pull up these comments so you can get your glory. <coughs> A few seconds, thank you. Okay, so Alex has said uh, four loops magic numbers. Yep, that's true. Ethan says the loop limit, that's also true. So, um, and here we go. Alex says also using two different methods for the same thing, star star and math.pow. Yeah. Oh, oh, actually, I think that's a typo. <laughs> that one might actually be a typo from when we converted this to Python. So I'm surprised that worked. Um, but just for the, maybe that does work in JavaScript. Never tried it. Um, but just to give you an example, what this program does is if you run it with two as a command line argument, it will print out, you know, 10 to 20 squared or 10 to 19 squared. And if you run it with three, it'll print out 10, and 10 to 19 cubed. So that's the behavior of the program here like that. Now, yes, there are some obvious places we can pull things out, such as the loop limit, right? So I could define something up the top if I wanted to, um, maybe make it an uppercase variable. It depends, like, you know, should it be uppercase? Should it have a particular pattern? It really depends on what the linter you're using says, because different linters have different opinions. But let's say, um, let's say, yeah, we'll go like uh, loop lower is 10 and we'll go loop higher is 20, something like that, right? And now we can go and use these two variables and we can avoid ourselves having to 
Declare it twice. You know the drill. Okay, loop lower and loop higher. Um, Alex also says we could just replace the exponent with num. Yeah, exactly. So if num is 2, then we are essentially raising it to the power of 2. And if num is 3, we're raising it to the power of 3. And we can also do that inside of our string uh, here. Exact same thing. Great. Okay, so again, we're repeating ourselves less in the sense that we're not having to put in those magic numbers. However, what's one thing we notice here? Now we notice that suddenly with our code, these two blocks are identical. I could kind of highlight them. You can see they're actually identical. So we don't even need those two separate if and else statements. And all we're doing here by repeating ourselves less is we are just e exposing our code to get simpler and simpler which means that if someone comes along to change an aspect of this, they're not going to have to worry about changing two different sets of for loops or two different console logs because there's one source of truth. So we can simply say, well, let's check if num is equal to 3 or num, num is equal to 2 or num is equal to 3. We don't even need that extra uh, else if statement. And immediately now you can see the code is already starting to look just a little bit easier, a little bit cleaner. Um, Great. That's nice and easy. What are some other things we may or may not be able to do here? If anyone has any other opinions. We could check that our code works just by running it again. See if it still gives us the output we want. Okay, yep, still works. Would anyone change anything else? There's not a huge amount you could kind of do here, to be honest. Um, <coughs> you know, sometimes you'll hear people say things like, oh, I've noticed the pro... Okay, actually, this is this is why I kind of wrote the example like this. Let's take a look at process.exit1 here. So there's a temptation to abstract this out. How can I only define this once? Well, this is actually quite tricky to do because... There's two, inst there's two circumstances when you want to use process.exit. The first circumstance is parsing in the argv length before you've actually gotten the number out of argv. But the problem is the second time you call it is after you've extracted it out. So essentially, you need to call it before you get the information and you need to potentially call it also after you get the information. So in cases like this, you actually it's actually very difficult to reduce it to a single source of truth. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's particularly feels annoying, but it's like totally normal. One thing that I see students do a lot is they'll go and make a function called crash. And inside that function, they'll go and put process.exit1, and then they will simply call crash here, and then they'll call crash at the bottom. Now, the reason I think this is really interesting is because when students do that, there's there's this very noble hunt they're doing to try and reduce the instances of something in your code to a single source. But the problem here is that what you've done is you've essentially gone and replaced a meaningful function, process.exit, which most decent programmers of this language would understand what it means. You've gone and replaced it with something called crash. Uh, which now someone has to go and understand. Someone has to go and figure out what that means. There's a new idea introduced to them. Is this to say that doing this is bad? No, I wouldn't say that doing this is bad because if you have a very specific error code and it's going to crash in a third place, maybe it's good to put it in a single source of truth so no one can screw it up. There are no real right or wrong answers here. There are just things to consider depending on your circumstance. So, how the code is here is probably okay. JavaScript isn't as powerful as some other languages <coughs> that are very good at doing very concise for loops between fixed numbers. But that's okay. We can leave this alone from here. So that's the question. Is there one source of truth for this? The second question we're going to ask is, is this as simple as possible? Now, I know this might sound like a bit of a silly question, but it's actually a very important question um, because maintainable software is simple software. There's a very, very strong correlation here. If you use the sim you, you should always try and use the simplest tools to solve a problem in the simplest way. The more code you write, um, the more code you have to maintain. It's actually, it's actually very straightforward. Again, we all kind of understand this. If you buy a bigger house, you've got more grass to mow. 
it, it's all along the same thread. So every every piece of software you write is another square meter you have to maintain. And you know, there's a very important idea to keep in your head, which is that every every line of code you don't write is bug free. So if you go and write a piece of a program that's 500 lines of code, you have to somehow make sure that your 500 lines of code has as few bugs as possible, and even then you'll never be able to guarantee it. But if you go and write a thousand lines of code, you've got even more lines of code to debug and guarantee now. So when you write less code, all those lines of code that you were tempted to write but you didn't write, they're all kind of bug free by default because they don't exist. And that's the best kind of assurance you have is when something's not a problem because you know it just doesn't exist. The Sometimes we refer to this um, approach as keep it simple, stupid. You might have heard this thrown around in many different aspects of, of life or something like that. Um, it's really just the idea that software works best when it's kept simple. And it's the belief that complexity and errors are correlated. It's the idea that um, if your code is more complex, if, if it's harder to understand, if it's, if it's unnecessarily complicated, it will probably have bugs in it. And this one is very hard for young programmers to overcome. And many of you are probably at a stage where, or, or you will be soon, where you'll actually have to think a bit more deeply about this. And you'll have to somewhat rewire yourself to think that clear code is much better than clever code. Um, no real sane person likes clever code if it could be simpler. That might be a bit of a dramatic statement, but, um, you know, <coughs> let's just pretend it's true. The, the, reason, the reason a lot of this stuff is pointed out is because what, what typically happens is that as a, as a programmer, when you start learning how to code... It's all very hard and scary. You don't really understand what you're doing. You you work hard to understand it. And then once you get it, you start to get that confidence in you <coughs> and you start to enjoy writing things that your previous self would not have understood, right? Consciously, subconsciously, whatever. And this this is a this is a period again, I, I'm speaking generally. I'm not talking about you specifically if you're listening whoever you are, but you will see that kind of programmers throughout uni, they go through a stage where they like their code to be complex before they like it to be simple. And you'll generally find that as programmers get older and as you work with more and more senior programmers, if they go to solve a problem, they'll, they'll give you increasingly more and more boring solutions, the older and the more senior they get. Because what they've been through is a very long history of overcomplicating a solution and then regretting it because it was full of bugs and issues and, and whatnot. And they said, you know, damn, I overcomplicated that. And again, I don't need to explain this too much to you because you've all probably overcomplicated something in your life, right? <coughs> and you've all said, I really should have just kept that to be much simpler than it you know, needed to be. So one of the most common examples of where, just let me check these rules again. One of the most common examples of where this appears, is this as simple as possible, is the use of external libraries. So, <coughs> if you get asked to write a function that generates a random string with up to 50 characters that consists of lowercase and uppercase characters, a random string generator, uh, it's very tempting, again, to go and write a complex solution by doing it from first principles, but a much better solution is actually just to, oops, there's no extra lecture slide there, is actually just to go and look up libraries to do it for you. So one of the simplest ways, again, that you can keep your code simple is by looking, up, looking through NPM libraries or whatever libraries exist for the language you're working with and seeing if you can leverage those uh, for you. For instance, here we've got random string. So let's say I'm writing a node program. I might Google NPM random string and see what a library does. Okay, there's a library called random string. That's pretty convenient. Okay, and then I'm going to come down here and here. Okay, it's like random string dot generate. I give it a number, it generates a string of that length. Let's go down to the API. Sure, so I call it generate and then it says it has a bunch of options and it lets me pick a character set. It lets me pick a length. Okay, so it's like, this is the kind of thing. I can actually make my life easier and simpler by now coming here and I'm going to go and install random number, the library, and I'm going to go make a code, piece of code. I'll call it random.ts. And I'll just, you know, what does is, what is the example here say? Um, 
By the way, if you if you ever see this online, I'm sure some of you would have seen this with npm. This is the old style of writing fun uh, imports. It's it's exactly the same as um, writing it like this. So you know, if you haven't figured that out already, that's just what you can do. Uh, let's just double check this is working. Uh, let's actually run the file. Oh. Random number. How do I install it? Random string. Oops. Silly, silly, silly. Okay. npm install random string. <coughs> Beautiful. Let's run the code. npm run ts node source slash random dot ts. Make sure it runs okay. Runs perfectly. Now we can call generate or we could console log random string dot generate because this is what the docs tell us to do. And I can also see in the docs that uh, here are the options length and character set alphabetic. What does alphabetic mean? It means A to Z, A to Z. Well, that's exactly what we want, isn't it? Lowercase and uppercase characters. Easy, we haven't even had to read the docs too much. We've just copied this particular example. Suddenly we have everything we want here. I call this again. Great. Uh, 10, sorry, length should be 50. And suddenly we've kept things again simple. So you might now, as a programmer, you might see someone in your team or someone you work with come up with this big crazy idea and you can actually ask them again, is this as simple as it could be? Have you gone and seen if there's a third party library that does this for you rather than writing it yourself? So a very, very powerful question. Similar thing, write a function that prints what day of the week it is. There are other NPM libraries out there called like date functions that again, I'm not going to take you through it, but because I <coughs> think we looked at this early on, unless I'm absolutely crazy. Pretty sure this was in the earlier examples. So, you know, again, you could go to those libraries. And then the third example here, you had a lab with date functions. That's right. And a third example is if someone says, can you write me a program that takes in command line arguments? And you might, again, you might jump to a terrible way to start. I'm going to call this cmd.ts. You might think, oh, well, I know that I can import argv from process. And therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a program that's really smart. And what it's going to do is that when I um, when I pass in arguments like, you know, save, dev, hello, I'm going to capture all that because, you know, they're just argv values. So I have them in an array, even though that got filtered out. That was rude. Okay, not sure why I did that. Um, and you could, again, you could kind of go and do all this by yourself, but one of the easiest ways to keep your code simple is just to leverage things that exist. Um, I know these examples are all kind of the same, but there is a library, for instance, in um, Node or JavaScript called Commander, and it essentially allows you to write nice little pieces of code like this where you can you can define a program and that pro those programs can have options, and then you can parse things and then use things. Uh, and it allows you to write quite smart utilities um, I'll give you an example let's go and copy this code for a second we'll just try it out and I think all, I, all I'll have to do here is I'm just going to change the import like that and I'm just going to npm install commander and I hope that's the right npm library name Oop, oop. Uh, yep, and then we just run this and let's see what happens. Yep, so look at that. You ever run a nice program like GCC or Git or something and it gives you all these commands? Well, we have our own and all we've had to do is write a couple dozen lines of code and most of it, I mean, we didn't write any of it. We just copied it straight off the internet and it told us lots of useful things like how to run it, how to capture that. So again, keeping things really simple is often just about leveraging things that exist. A third question, um, one of my favorite questions of all the questions is the question, is this under or over designed? Um, <coughs> if you over design things, if you design things to be too complex than they should be, um, you often have very, very complex code and complex abstractions to maintain for trivial changes. A good example of over designing code is coming along and saying, you know what? Okay, for my random number, um, this is going to be called like, you know, let's, let's create a function here. Um, and it's going to be called, uh, random alpha string like this. And all this function is going to do is just going to return the, you know, 
the result of the result of this particular function call. Um, but then you think, oh, actually, I should get this uh, function set up for success in the future for all kinds of crazy things that might happen. And, you know, I'll actually put in an argument here that says, like, r, you know, uh, length equals 50. Um, and then you make this here, just length. And then you say, oh, well, what if someone wants to actually change the character set? So now you say, you know, character set equals uh, alphabetic. Okay. And then you do the exact same thing here. And then you come along and you go, oh, well, there's actually maybe like, you know, this particular one I want, it's like generate password. And I want generate password to just be to return random alpha string with, you know, 50 characters or, you know, just the default thing, whatever. And, and the thing is, what you can do is you can end up kind of creating all these series of pointless abstractions trying to think about all these other edge cases and you think oh what if someone wants to use it for a hash so now i'm going to say you know uh const generate you know hash or something which we'll talk about later on in the course and it's the exact same thing except you start going and changing this to a hundred and you make the character set you know and you what i don't even know if that works but what i'm doing here is i'm trying to think about the future i'm trying to think about all the crazy things that could happen and that's great because We've said to you that good code design, good design in general, is preparing things to be maintainable. It's setting yourself up so that your code will resist the tendency to break. Um, so, but, but again, there's a point where you actually prepare for the future so much that you over-engineer it. You over-specify um, it. And it ends up just costing you a lot of time. That's, that's, the best thing. that's the best case, is that it just costs you time. The worst case is that it actually makes it harder to adapt to changes because you have a lot more stuff to wade through. And then on the other end, the under design part is fairly intuitive because it's what we've been talking about a lot of tonight. And that's really just not doing enough work early on so that every single time there's like a new feature or a new change to the system, you have to go and like rewrite a function or re-abstract it out, which, which isn't very fun at all. Um, okay, this one is, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, <coughs> And I, th I think something that, so an area where this stands out as an example is that sometimes there can be a somewhat uh, militant obsession with never repeating yourself more than once. You know, remember that first question that was like, uh, was it the first question? Yeah, is there a single source of truth for this? Sometimes it's okay if there's two sources of truth for something because to, um, you know... Too, there, it's hard to give a concrete example. Sometimes it's just too hard. <coughs> Sometimes you might have two pieces of software that are totally unrelated, and to get them both using the exact same, you know, hash define or, or constant variable, you have to spend hours of research and everything else like that. A, a couple of examples that I'll give you when it comes to stuff that I deal with at work. Uh, one, um, we we have functions that run every day and they run at specific times of day and we specify the times of day. We specify that says this function needs to run at 4 p.m. This function needs to run at 7 p.m. And one problem we run into is that when you go in and out of daylight saving in Australia and the clock goes forward and back an hour, those functions need to come forward and back an hour too. And it's, it's to do with time zones and it's because those functions are actually technically set at like London time. So when we want a function to run at 3 p.m. in Sydney, we actually say, hey, function, we'd like you to run at 5 a.m. London time. But London time's always at 5 a.m. Like, so therefore, what happens is when daylight saving comes along, 10 a, like 5 a.m. in London is now 4 p.m. in Sydney instead of 3 p.m. So we need to kind of go in and change that function to run at 4 p.m. instead of 3 p.m. And it's very, very tempting to think, oh, I'm going to set myself up for the future and make my code more maintainable by automating that process by writing more code that will look at the time zone every day and it will calculate you know whether it's daylight saving or not and then it will go and call this particular function and we when we looked at that problem we opted to not solve that by writing code we opted to do it just manually two times a year because the best solution there was to actually just put two dates in the calendar every year. The daylight saving starting and the daylight saving ending. Or the other way around, I guess, technically. <coughs> and what happens is on those calendar days, someone on a work day 
goes in, they make a merge request to manually update all the times. They change all the 3 p.m.s to, to the, you know, 3 p.m.s to 4 p.m. or the 5 a.m.s to 6 a.m. and, you know, the 2 a.m.s to 3 a.m. and the middays to the 1 p.m. And they just go and do that manually. It takes a couple of minutes. And then we, we approve the merge request. We merge the merge request. And then the code now works for the next morning. And that's an example of us choosing not to over-design code because if we were to try and go write functions to help do that for us, we would probably introduce bugs. We would probably mean that if someone else new comes onto the project that they then come in and think, oh, I don't know how this works. Then they get confused and then people don't understand stuff. So whilst it can be, again, tempting to think maintainable software is just thinking as deeply as humanly possible about the future sometimes you can uh what's that like it was like shoot in the foot meme you you youngins will what is it yeah i don't know what the exact man someone sent oh these are just random clip arts this is going a bit weird but let's go with that i'll do uh yeah you don't want to be that uh so over design is an important one to think about under design you all kind of get that that's just not thinking deeply enough about things um Sometimes, sometimes, and I think this is just a bit of a, a lesson and we'll take a short break and we won't, we're nearly at the end. We only have like a few more questions to go and then we, then we wrap up. Um, and two of the questions are combined, so we'll get there in a sec. But, uh, you know, there was, there was another conversation we had at work a while ago where we were looking at two different data types. And one of the data types was this idea of money, you know, like real money, like actual cash. So you as a user might have $5. Um, and we store that in the data store somewhere. And then also you might have some credit, which is basically kind of free money we give you. That isn't real money. It's kind of like the right to money. It's like a voucher. It's essentially a voucher. And we were like, okay, we got vouchers and we got... <coughs> um, money cash vouchers in cash and one of the problems we had was that these two things um we were kind of thinking about the future and trying to think about how do we make sure that we like think deeply about the problem and write the code in a sustainable maintainable way and we considered for instance that should we combine these two ideas together and just be like well if you think about it vouchers kind of just like cash except you know you just can't like take it out of the, the the system. Like if I give you a fifty dollar JB Hi-Fi card to buy something with, and I give you a fifty dollar note, both of those things are just fifty dollars as far as JB Hi-Fi is concerned. So why not just treat them as the same? Why not just say that they're both just things? It's just one of them's a voucher, one of them's not. It's all just money. Is it you know? Is it withdrawable? Is it you know? Is it cash or not? And we kind of went through this this process of trying to figure this out and thinking about how scalable this will be. But again we got to a similar conclusion where we just said, you know what? Um, this is too complicated. We are complicating this. We are over-designing this. We are essentially trying to trying to generalize and simplify and reduce too many things to one source of truth that what will happen is that tomorrow or next week, we'll just find out that vouchers and cash are the same thing. And, you know, because suddenly someone says, all right, we want to add an expiry date to vouchers. And you think, oh, crap. Does that mean cash needs an expiry? Cash doesn't expire, right? And then someone says, yep, okay. And then vouchers are transferable and vou it just it, they're different things, you know? So there is, again, a tendency to overgeneralize or to try and over-abstract things together. There's a lot more examples I could go through. That wasn't even the one I was referencing here. Um, but I, I, could, I, could talk about, I could talk about system architecture and under-design, over-design for several hours and maybe days because it's all I've been doing for three years. So... Yeah, we can go through that anytime. Um, this is a very, very crude summary uh, of what I've seen over the years, which is basically that when you start off programming, because you're new to it, you don't think a lot about the future, so you'll tend to under-design your code. Once you get comfortable with programming, again, that kind of liking complexity and feeling smarter that comes in, uh, this kind of comes back to, you know, it's like the, what is it like the, what's that? chart um it's like the chart that's like the confidence chart the thing that there's like the valley of 
the va valley of uh someone someone tell me doesn't like they're like the valley of ignorance or something <laughs> Someone, uh, 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 oh, this might be close to it. Yeah, here we go. That's what I was looking for. Um, this this is a very similarly closely related concept. When when you start something, you don't know a lot about it, and you have really low confidence. But then you start to learn more about it, and then you you think you you have a lot of confidence because suddenly you know a bunch, and that's kind of where you get into that like over design, over engineering phase. I think a lot of young people can go through. Um, and then very quickly after that, once you start to kind of over-engineer your work and a lot of things start to crumble under the under the weight of your own genius, uh, you then very quickly kind of start going, oh my God, this is actually not what I thought. And then you, you tone it back down to something more um, manageable, basically. I mean, that, that's not what this chart is about. This chart just reminds me of that in a way. This is a funny chart about general learning about anything in life. Um, Okay, so uh, I don't know. I don't want. Maybe let's not take a break because I don't think there's much more. Yeah, let's just keep going. Um, there's no point having a five minute break if we're going to finish up in fifteen minutes. So, um, two other important questions. I think this is why I wrote that there's six questions because these are kind of the same thing. Very quick on this one. Are related modules kept close together? Oh, close together, and are unrelated modules kept far apart? So, coupling is the degree of interdependence between software components. So when we say software components, think about your auth functions and your channel functions and your user functions and your like message functions in your project. And coupling is, when we say how coupled is something, we're saying how closely are these things um, interrelated. So we want things that are related to be tightly coupled and things that are unrelated to be loosely coupled. So examples of that in your project, the login and the register function are tightly coupled. They are two things that are very relevant and they're related. So we keep them close together. We keep them in the same file. Things that are very different, such as register and creating a new channel in your team streams, whatever app, um, they're quite separate. So we kind of keep them separate. We keep the channels fi file over here and the auth file over here. So this is just a very, again, intuitive and straightforward concept of keeping things that are separate, separate, keeping things that are similar, similar, because again, as things in your software change over time, as new people come onto the project, it will substantially reduce the amount of issues you have um, with things just being all over the place. And back to the comments about organization, when we have excessive coupling, when we have excessive things that are unrelated that have been joined together or close together, we sometimes again refer to that as spaghetti code where everything's just tumbled on top of one another. You can't figure something out. You might again have experienced this when it comes to how you might store your files on the computer or how you store your tools in, in a workshop of some sort or how you store your art equipment for painting. When, when suddenly all these things that aren't related to each other are all stored together, it becomes impossible to do anything You've lost things. You don't know where they are. Sometimes you'll buy something because you think you've lost it, but it's just because it was in the wrong place. It's exactly this. Everything is exactly the same when it comes to code. If you think you've lost some code or code doesn't exist, you'll, you'll write some. And it existed over here. The number of times I've seen someone write a function to do something where another function exists. You don't feel this yet because most of what you've been doing so far, because you're only, you know what, a few courses into university. Some of you have been programming for less than 15 weeks, um, cumulatively. Uh, everything's so small, you're not going to forget about stuff. So th this is kind of these things to keep in mind as you start to work in increasingly bigger and bigger and more diverse groups. Question six, am I speak, speak, speculating? Am I speculating about how necessary this is? Um, this kind of comes a little bit back to the over design or over engineering part, except it's somewhat, um, somewhat a bit more pointed, and it's it's really a, a subset of that over engineering question, which is pointing out that you should be vigilant when you're writing code to make sure that you actually need this. And a great way to solve this problem when you write code is to do what we call top down code design. And what that means is that if I, if I give you a question like this, given two latitude, longitude coordinates, let's say we've got some file up here. 
Um, find out what time I would arrive at my destination if I left now. Assume I travel at the local country's highway speed. So, the <coughs> the worst way to write code generally is to start from the bottom and go up. And that is to think about, okay, well, what does this function need? This function needs to be able to, like, I need to start Googling how to calculate, like, longitudes and latitudes and distances. I need to start Googling how to look up APIs to find my local country's highway speed and all of that. And what you're doing there is you're actually speculating about the underlying tools you'll need to solve the problem. And a top-down code design approach is really to come in and say, well, what is this? Given two latitudes. Okay, so it's a function. It's called something. It's a, it takes in a latitude and a longitude, and it's a lat one and long one and lat two, long two. Find out what time I would arrive at my destination uh, if I left now. Okay, time between. There's my function. Function time between takes in latitude one, longitude one, latitude two, longitude two. Now, I don't know how this function is going to work yet, but let's try and finish it treating my other function like. Let's try and finish this now. And instead of trying to solve it all within one function, let's break it up into a series of smaller functions. So what do I what do I know? Um, there's a distance between latitude one, longitude one, latitude two, longitude two. And there's a certain speed of the country's highways. So I'm going to write two. I'm going to do two function calls to functions that don't exist. Const distance equals uh, distance between which will take in latitude 1, longitude 1, latitude 2, longitude 2 and then let's say I'm gonna write another function called highway speed which will call get highway speed lat 1, long 1. Maybe that needs to take in a location and let's just assume everything's the same. Um, great and then what do we need to return the time between? Well, you know, speed equals distance over time. So time equals distance over speed, right? Yeah, is that how it works? Sure. Um, so now I can say, you know, like my const time is just my distance over my highway speed. And I can just return time. Now, what's really interesting about this approach, and maybe let me put it in here, is that I... And writing this code top down in the sense that I'm solving the problem at a high level, not worrying about how the distance is calculated or the highway speed is calculated. And I'll go and break those functions up here. I'll go and write them after. You know, and maybe these functions will call other functions. And this is actually a really great way just in general to write code in this way so that um, it, it, it kind of forces you to break your code up into functions without realizing because what it does is it relies on your own laziness to solve your problems for you, your code design problems, because you think, wow, I'm way too lazy to calculate the distance between latitude longitude. Let's write a function for it and I'll kick that problem down to my future self in five minutes. And your future self takes that function and it goes and Google stuff and it might say, wow, okay, this is pretty easy, but there's one part of this which is really complicated with some math, and I'm going to go and call a function that hasn't been written yet and defer that to my five minutes in the future self, you know? And you're essentially, you kind of imagine it like, you know, you're dropping a, um, you know, squirting some water down one of those, like, trees that just kind of trickles down and percolates through everything, and you're starting from the top and, and going out and calling functions, and those functions call functions. The benefit of this approach is that it avoids you writing code that you don't need because the only functions you write are ones you need because you started from the very first function that you're actually calling. Whereas when you start from the really low level functions, sometimes you'll write them and then you'll come back up and write the higher level functions, but you'll actually never need a function you wrote and you'll just end up deleting it anyway. Or the worst case is you won't end up deleting it and it will just live there forever being completely unused. Um, one thing that, for instance, again, uh, I set up over summer in, in our code base was something that went through the code base and looked for functions that were in the code base that weren't used by anyone. Uh, and that way it was like a way we could, as a team, maintain our software's maintain, well, we could ensure our software's maintainability because if you can reduce the amount of code again in your code base, that's good. So if a function is no longer used, 
the pipeline essentially throws an error now and says, no, no, there is a problem. There's a function that's no longer used. Use it or delete it. It's a little bit like the whole you've defined a variable but haven't used it. Uh, it's like that, but, you know, same kind of thing. So that's a very good question. And then the very last question here is, does this follow standard conventions? This one I added in at the end, and I'm, I'm scared I nearly forgot it because it's one of the, one of the coolest questions, um, which is, has this been solved before? And if so, and this is the important part, has this been solved in a certain way? The question, has this been solved before, kind of came up with the whole keep it simple thing. Keep it simple by not rewriting things all the time. You can keep it simple just by doing something that's been written before. But there's, there's, a much, there's an even more important thing, which is just because a library exists, just because a programming pattern exists, it doesn't mean that you should just go and work with it however you want. But you should actually look at how other people use things. Really good example. We know that last week we learned about Express, the Node.js web application framework, when we were writing a web server. Now, what you'll notice about Express is that they give you a bunch of examples like this. And you'll see that those examples like this, uh, they kind of come with names like app and port. And, you know, uh, you know, this again would be import express from express. But what, what again you'll see some programmers do is kind of come in and be like, you know what, I don't really like request and response. I'm just going to call it in and out. And instead of app, I'm going to call it like, you know, uh, Teams or something because, you know, we're making a Teams app. And instead of port, we might call it like, you know, I mean, you know, port, port would be really, if you came, I don't know, if you change port, you're, I don't know what you're doing. Um, but let's say you did this. This code ticks a lot of those boxes we were dealing with. It uses a library. It's not over-engineered. I don't know how it could be. It's not under-engineered. Uh, all of those things. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't follow standard conventions. Most people writing an express library would just use what's in the example docs. They would use request and response and app and all those other things. And without that, your code is slightly less maintainable because it means, again, when you have other people come in, who've worked with Express before, they look at the code and they think, what? Oh, I don't know what a lot of this does. Or when you have people who are in your team who haven't worked with Express before, suddenly they're now trying to look through examples online. They're trying to look through uh, the documentation online. And, and they're not able to correlate what they see in the docs to what they see in front of them with the code. And that means that they're more likely to make a mistake, to put something in the wrong spot, to write something totally new because they think it doesn't exist or it's actually named incorrectly. So following standard conventions is a very important concept um, just because it makes everyone's life easier because they know what to expect. And we all kind of get this, right? It's, it's like why... Um, it's why I really hate... Has anyone noticed in Sydney that, uh, you know, if you go near a train station in Sydney, it has this, like, giant T? Um... Who's caught a train before in Sydney? There'll be a, there'll be a station here. There'll be a T. Just looking for a T. You've all seen it, right? Like outside of stations, there'll be like the big. Uh... God darn. George Street. I swear, there's one on George Street. Oh, I don't know. You know the T I'm talking about? Sydney train sign. Yeah, everyone does. Yeah, this T, this, thank you, sorry. Uh, some people just wouldn't know what the hell I'm talking about. I hate this. I hate this so much. Everyone knows what a train looks like. Can you imagine how annoying this is if you come to Australia and you don't speak English? And you don't know what, what this symbol is? Like, is that an axe? Is this where you buy hammers? You know, it's not. Like, how hard is it to just use a picture of a train? Or a picture of a bus for B. You know, you know what I mean? And I don't like this because this is a bit of a stretch on standard conventions because this is more just about, you know, accessibility and, and all of that. But it's the same kind of thing. If you just use... If you use symbols and patterns and motifs that people are used to from all over the place, then no matter who you kind of come in and get, they will be able to quickly absorb what is going on as opposed to seeing this sign and thinking, Great! I'm exactly where I need to be. I don't know the English language or the alphabet. Um, yeah, anyway. Great to finish that off on my little angry... Uh, yeah, like, I like it. It's, like, simple, but 
I, I like it as someone who knows what it is too. M's a bit of a weird thing. Maybe M. It depends where you are. You know, they, like there could be more. Um, yeah, <laughs> Kai a minute for that. But and I know I know this is common. You know, this is like the metro in Greece and stuff. It's just the point is that people 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 know what some things are and other things they have to take a moment to figure out. This one's a bit of a stretch. I've just been looking for an excuse to complain about this for a few years. So um, yeah, look at this. They used to have it. Oh my god. I mean, you know, yeah, it's nice. Great. Great. Good. Um, <laughs> Alex says, how could you tell a train from a metro, I think? Um, let's not get into the politics of Sydney transport, but I think there's I think there's some politics behind why trains and metros are called something else, even though for a normal person, they're just all trains, right? <laughs> like, a normal person just wants to get from A to B. Um, but anyway... Standard conventions, the same principles apply everywhere in life. They apply in code. They're the reason that it's so easy to go to so many places, new places you haven't been before, um, and make sense of things around you. It's exactly the same in code. So whilst it's tempting sometimes to be like, hmm, I don't like calling it app, it's also hard to tell what's like a standard convention when you haven't programmed much because like if you haven't programmed much and you've never used the express library you're not going to be sitting there like ah oh, app the common variable usage for an express server instantiation that's not how you're going to be thinking but the point is that as you become more confident and more well read and you understand what normal is stick to normal is is the point there yeah, like uh, this is an example. Sometimes I'll see people do this. This is like one of, this is something I've noticed a couple of years ago and it's been on my mind a lot. Sometimes students will have a, a, a function, a call to a function like the date library. Uh, they'll call new date dot two ISO string. This basically just gives you an ISO string of the current date. We could do that. We could just run the node terminal and it's not that complicated what it does. It prints that out like 20, 22, 6, 28, 9, 14. This is again, England time because every computer likes to exist in England time. And, and people will go and write um, functions around something like this called date now or something else. And then they will call date now. And you just have to think about, again, this is kind of cute because you think, I've abstracted my code a little bit. And that's true. That's important if you're calling this many, many times and a few other things. There are no blanket solutions. And that's also why I like to ask questions and not tell you things. Because... Does this follow standard conventions? I mean, a bit of a stretch for that question, but someone who's a JavaScript programmer will come and see this and they will know what it means. They've probably seen this before. If you're working with them, they've probably seen it somewhere else. When they see date now, they have no idea what it means. And once again, they will potentially, that, could, that could potentially cause some issues. So keeping things really, really simple. Um, last example... Then we're nearly done. Um, <coughs> ah, I made okay. So I made this one this term because I was trying to prove a point, and may maybe I'm a moron. But um, here's a function called loop, which takes an account and it loops from zero to count, and then it calls a function which is passed as an argument. Remember first first class functions uh, every time with that number. And what it allows us to do is to actually, instead of writing something like, you know, for int, uh, not int, for let i equals zero, i less than five, i plus plus, console log i, instead of writing this code, which is very confusing and complicated, we could just write this, loop five console log. Console log is a function we're passing in as an argument. And like, again, in some scenarios, this might be appropriate because you might be doing a great number of these things. There are, no, there are no clear right and wrong answers, but the consideration you have to ask yourself is, while this does, yes, repeat yourself less, what it's doing is it's causing you to create more and more terms and semantics in your code that other people have to understand. Can you imagine how annoying this is to make sense of? Like, if I saw this somewhere and I was like, like, if someone made this and they were doing these things everywhere all the time, Maybe it's like, okay, I can see what you're doing there. You're trying to simplify the code. But if they only done this twice, you'd just be like, just write the two for loops, you know? Because then I could at least understand it quickly. Because one of the main reasons we try and simplify code is to improve its understandability. 
So if you're simplifying code by in the function call, but making it substantially more complicated because that function you're calling is calling something very not simple, even though it's one source of truth, now you're kind of breaking what people expect to see in their code. And I'd argue that this is a, this is a regression from clean code for something like this in this use case. But that doesn't mean that anything like this is. So in summary, we have these questions. And again, you should talk to people about this. Talk to your teammates. Talk to other programmers you meet, people you're in your courses with. There are more questions than this. Like, good code design for code maintainability is not a set of rules. Every circumstance is different. There's no way you could apply anything universally, but these are considerations that you need to keep in your mind that will help you write better code um, throughout your life, maybe. Last thing, <coughs> conversations about code design don't finish just because your software's finished. No one writes perfect code the first time. This isn't about, okay, before you used to write some substandard code, think about these questions and your code will be perfect. No, you will continue to write bad code. I write bad code every day. Refactoring though is the process of restructuring existing code without changing its external behavior. It's essentially rewriting code without changing any of what it does. Typically, we refactor code to fix poor code design um, in existing code to make it more maintainable. Sometimes we say a little bit of refactoring now, a little bit of code cleanup now will make our lives much better down the past, <laughs> down the past, in the future. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that refactoring is strongly discouraged if you don't have a strong test suite. Blind refactoring is really potentially dangerous. And I've seen a lot of instances in my time of what people do is they write code that isn't maybe the cleanest code. Then they come along and they say, I need to refactor it because if I don't refactor it, it's going to be really unmaintainable and there's going to be, it's going to get buggy in the future. And what they do is they go refactor it, but the code was worked. They're kind of like six out of 10 code was working when they try and turn it to 9 out of 10 code, they introduce a whole bunch of bugs and stuff because they weren't tests for anything. And then all of a sudden, all that kind of improvement you were doing to help with future bugs was kind of completely outweighed by how much you destroyed in the short term. So refactoring is something you should tread lightly about if you don't have a lot of tests. In fact, that's a big reason why we like tests again, because it allows you to refactor, to clean up code, with a strong foundation to make sure that you know your code is not regressing in quality. Okay, thank you for that long stint. That's the end of today's lecture. That's all we have tonight. Um, so please pause the video, fill out the feedback form. Really appreciate your feedback. Uh, I haven't looked in a, in a week as to how many people are filling it in, but always appreciate it. Don't stop learning about code maintainability. It's probably one of the few things we teach in this course that you should think about forever and ever and ever. Um, and the more you think about it, the happier I'll be.